Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first 2DCC webinar of the fall 2022 series. Today we have um, Dr. Walter Mormons, PhD. He's at MIT and is in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Today he's going to be talking about 2D calcogenides. He's going to focus on rotational domains. I want to also make you aware that um, Dr. Mortelmans is also a user of the 2DCC and has been to our facility and has turned the cranks on the machine. So he may introduce that in his talk. He may not. We'll see what he has to say. Thank you, Dr. Mortelmans. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Kevin, for the uh, nice introduction. Also, thank you for this invitation. I'm very happy to, to share uh, the results of my work. Uh, over the past six years as a PhD student at IMEC and KU Leuven, but also uh, as my, I'm currently a postdoc at MIT in the lab of Rafael Jaramillo. Um, so my name is indeed Wad Mortemans. The title of my talk is Epitaxy of Two-Dimensional Mono, D, and Tree Calcogonides with a focus on rotational domains. That's basically what I've been doing over the past six years. Uh, quite some experience in epitaxial growth of these two-dimensional calcogonides and um, fighting against these rotational domains. So that's why I also like to focus on them. So as a short outline of uh, this talk of today, uh, I will first give you a few slides on why we are interested in two-dimensional calcogonide materials. And then I basically split up the presentation into three uh, big pa major parts. The first part is about uh, monocalcogonides. The second part is about transition metal dicalcogonides. A third part about tricalcogonides. And then I'll wrap up the talk with uh, a few short conclusions. Uh, so to start my presentation, I would like to uh, draw your attention uh, to the popularity of these uh, two-dimensional calcogonides. So here uh, in, in one year ago in 2021, I did a review uh, on two-dimensional calcogonides and I went to uh, websites like two-dimensional semiconductors and HQ graphene. And I, I looked at what kind of uh, compounds, binary compounds are available that you can just buy from, from the website. And then you can see that there's like a whole bunch of materials that you can that you can buy. So these two-day calcogonides are very popular. They already fill a big portion of the periodic table, and it's it's even more expanding year after year. You can also buy these uh, some of these compounds in in different phases. For example, indium selenide, for example, is known as a monocalcogonide, but it's also uh, possible to, to have indium two selenium three, So it's, it's, it exists in different compounds and they're just very popular. There is lots of interest in these two-dimensional calcogonides. So it's very, in these materials are very interesting uh, for uh, research and for device demonstrations. So from this website, you can buy crystals like this, large uh, micrometer sized uh, crystals they are single crystalline, so it's a very, very good uh, crystalline quality. Um, and that is very interesting. Uh, lots of the work, lots of interesting work is being done on crystals like this uh, for, for research and device demonstrations. So here I show you a series of three different compounds, tin selenide, molybdenum disulfide, bismuth selenide. The crystal structure is shown below. They all share a similar kind of structure where in the plane you have these strong covalent interactions, while out of the plane, these uh, layers are uh, bound together by weaker interactions, which we call van der Waals interactions. And that's why we say that these are layered uh, two-dimensional uh, materials. That's also shown here uh, in, in this graph, which shows actually the interaction energy of two atoms when you bring them closer to each other. In the scenario where you form a covalent bond, you have a deep uh, well here, and then this deep, the depth of this well corresponds to the binding energy. For a covalent interaction, this binding energy is relatively large. For a van der Waals interaction, this energy is relatively weak. Uh, it's one order of magnitude weaker compared to covalent interactions. So these layers are bound together by very, very weak interactions. And that is very useful because uh, you can exfoliate from these large crystals using scotch tape. You can exfoliate some layers from these crystals you can put them on, on a silicon wafer, and then you can do some very nice experiments on, uh, on this kind of uh, structures that you have here. And lots of the work that is out there in publications today 
is done based on uh, this method. So you buy high quality uh, crystals, you exfoliate them, and then you look for interesting properties for new physics, and you try to do some device demonstrations based on uh, such, uh, such structures. We are very interested in, in these materials because they have a wide range of applications. Uh, for example, I cannot name them all. There's like a, a large variety of applications, but it's known that transition metal dicocoganides for like, for example, molybdenum disulfide or tungsten diselenide are very interesting for, for electronics uh, or logic applications. Uh, they have an atomically thin thickness. They will have superb electrostatic controls, so it can be very interesting to scale down the size of transistors to the atomic limit. Uh, they have a decent mobility value, so it's very interesting for, for logic applications. But also optical properties of these two-dimensional calcogonites are interesting. They have a direct band gap in the visible range. They can change to indirect band gap when you increase the thickness. Also for photonic applications, uh, some of these two-dimensional materials, they have anisotropic optical properties, which is interesting to modulate light, for example. Two-dimensional materials also have a large surface to volume uh, area, so that's interesting for sensors, also for photovoltaics and many, many more applications. You can also start stacking different two-dimensional materials on top of each other to create uh, novel physics and new uh, properties. So it's like a wide range of applications are possible with these 3D materials. However, if you wanna use these materials in large scale applications, we have to find a way how to, how to integrate these materials on a wafer. And then van der Waals epitaxy is very key. That becomes a very critical aspect of it because that's a way how you can integrate these materials on a large uh, uh, size wafer. And that's also what you see in the literature, for example, over the last few years, the amount of citations on van der Waals epitax is really boosting because it's very critical uh, to make this, to transform these materials from lab to uh, uh, more fab-like uh, scales. Van der Waals epitax is reported for the first time in, in the 90s by the group of Coma et al. The difference about van der Waals epitax is that it's now epitaxy governed by weaker interactions. So it's governed by van der Waals interactions while conventional epitaxy is governed by stronger interactions. So the fact that you have weaker interactions will clearly have an impact on your epitaxial growth. You will also have to do some substrate pretreatment here to passivate, for example, dangling bonds in order to allow van der Waals interactions to, to occur here at the interface between a two-dimensional material and a three-dimensional substrate, for example. Uh, what are the possible uh, techniques to epitaxially integrate two-dimensional calcogonides? You have atomic layer deposition, uh, where you try uh, to, to pulse your different precursors uh, and to try to grow two-dimensional materials uh, using, using such an approach. But it's inherently challenging because ALDs relies on like lots of chemistry and chemical reactions, uh, while van der Waals interactions are more physical reactions, so it's, 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 it's quite challenging. You also have a very interesting approach, uh, which is called metal organic chemical, chemical vapor deposition, so MOCVD or MOVPE. That's a technique which is preferred uh, by industry. Uh, you can, for example, use molybdenum hexacarbonyl and H2S in your uh, growth chamber. You have uh, chemisorption, you have chemical reactions at your surface, and then you can try to grow molybdenum disulfide using uh, this approach. And then lastly, you also have the approach of molecular beam epitaxy, which is uh, based on physical uh, deposition. So you don't have a lot of chemistry going on. So it's very interesting to, to really measure uh, the, the, the aspects, physical aspects of van der Waals epitaxy. So I don't have expertise in, in ALD of two-dimensional materials. I have a little bit of expertise in, in MOCVD of 2D materials, but most of my expertise and also most of the, the, this presentation will, uh, will, will We'll be talking about MB growth of uh, these two dimensional organites. If we then look into the literature about how these 2D materials are grown epitaxially, you see that there are quite some challenges. You see lots of different kinds of defects. For example, you see that you have very large mosaic spreads. Uh, so this is here in, in XRD, RSM. You can see that this mosaic spread of hafnium ditelluride is relatively large, like around 10 degrees. So it means that these two-dimensional materials, they 
they have difficulties in finding the right position uh, on top of your substrate. You also see that you, have, you can have quite some impurities in your layer that is difficult to grow layer by layer. It, these layers tend to grow in multiple layers before closing the first layer, for example. You have a high density of grain boundaries, different type of grain boundaries, and also rotational domains are quite frequently observed here. This is the case for tungsten isenolite grown on mica. You see that all these different peaks that you have here are corresponding to uh, rotational domains. And this also results in, in high defect density, of course. So my talk is focused on rotational domains during epitaxial growth of these materials. But of course, when you have rotational domains and these crystals coalesce together, they form grain boundaries. So it also includes grain boundaries. And of course, rotational domains are also linked with a large mosaic spread. If your crystal doesn't know how to position itself exactly in which direction, it will also uh, create a large mosaic spread. So it's all a bit linked uh, together. Um, so as a first part, I will uh, discuss uh, the monocal coconides. So we basically focused here on thin selenide as a two-dimensional compound. This is basically uh, the work that I, that I did uh, during my postdoc at MIT. And this is also the work uh, I did uh, in the terms of a research project uh, when I went to Penn State and I did some experiments over there at the 2DCC. So thin selenide is a special Van der Waals material. It's a triaxial uh, two-dimensional material. So that means that not only out of the plane, uh, the bonding environment is anisotropic, it's also in the plane that you have an anisotropic uh, crystal structure. And you can see this here, for example, uh, from this side view uh, represented the crystal structure. If you rotate your crystal structure of SNC by 90 degrees, you can also see that you have in the plane, a different uh, bonding environment. So the, in, the crystal structure is in the plane also highly anisotropic. And that leads to properties that are also in the plane anisotropic. And that's very interesting for applications. But of course, if you grow this material epitaxially and you start to have rotational domains, then you lose your anisotropic properties. So if you wanna make, if you wanna use SNSC for uh, some applications and we want to make use of this anisotropic crystal structure we have to make sure that we have no twins otherwise we lose this benefit of these anisotropic properties so no twins are allowed here uh, for snsc and then in in the research group that i'm currently in we are very interested in the anisotropic properties uh the anisotropic optical properties of tin selenide because that's very useful for uh, some optical applications so what we did is we took a bulk crystal of SNSC, the ones that you can buy online, and then we measured with spectroscopic ellipsometry, the optical constants, the refractive index and the extinction coefficient. And then you can clearly see indeed that these different uh, directions, the zigzag orientation and the armchair orientation, they have fundamentally different, they have some quite, quite differently uh, refractive index here. The contrast, here, so delta N is around one, so it's a relatively large difference in refractive index, which is very useful for uh, optical or photonic applications. And that is shown here with the simulation. So we simulated a ring resonator and we placed molybden, we placed a monolayer of thin selenide on top of this ring resonator, and this modulates, uh, this, this interferes with the effective uh, refractive index in this ring. And then you can modulate uh, the light, for example. And this is a very interesting way uh, to uh, change the transmission to this waveguide, depending on how you align your tin selenide with respect to this ring resonator. So it's very useful, these different anisotropic optical properties for uh, these kind of applications. But it turns out also to be very interesting for uh, metrology. And that will be presented here uh, in this slide. So the fact that these, these SNSCs anisotropic in the plane also uh, made us made it possible for us to develop a new and fast metrology technique to, to measure rotational domains uh, in SNSC. So we relied, we just used optical microscope, a very simple optical microscope that was equipped with a polarizer and with an analyzer. So we have white light that is incident on the SNSC and we polarize it in a linear fashion. And then it will be reflected on top of the SNSC surface. And this reflection depends on the Fresnel coefficients. 
And these Fresnel coefficients, they depend on the optical properties. So now reflection is dependent on the orientation of your uh, thin selenite. And then you, me you measure uh, the reflected beam. And this is here in the middle, you can see a simulation on what is the spectrum of the reflected beam, how it looks like in function of the orientation of SNSC. And then we can basically observe if the SNSC is at 45 degrees with respect to the analyzer, we will have this blue spectrum here, which basically corresponds to a peak at a yellow color. And if the SNSC is rotated by 90 degrees, we see this orange spectrum here, which basically corresponds to a maximum at a blue colors. So that's basically how we found out with this simulation that depending on the orientation of SNSC, we can make SNSC reflect yellow light or blue light. So that's now very useful to develop a growth recipe for, for tin sunlight because we can use this simple uh, metrology method using optical microscopy to measure uh, 9 degree twins, for example, to measure rotational uh, domains in epitaxial growth of tin sunlight. So then, uh, we uh, started doing some actual uh, recipes for SNSC on cubic magnesium oxide. So this is work that is that we did at uh, at the facilities of the 2DCC. So we grew SNSC on cubic magnesium oxide. We have some uh, sharp reed streaks here, and then on the AFM uh, characterization, we observed that we are able to grow relatively large crystals with a size of one micrometer that are relatively thick, 30 nanometers. And from these crystals, we see that we have the 110 facets, which are in agreement with the low energy facets that should form in, in SNSC. But of course, from, from this AFM image, we don't know if these cubes, if these squares, if they are rotated with 90 degrees with respect to each other or not. If you look at the epitaxial relation, we anticipated that we would have these 90 degree oriented domains, these 90 degree twins, but we cannot see it from AFM. So that's where this very simple and easy optical microscopy technique came into play. We just place it under optical microscope, we insert the analyzer and the polarizer, and then we can basically observe that some of these crystals reflect yellow light, other crystals, they mainly reflect blue light, confirming that they are rotated by 90 degrees. So that's very useful information. We did some more advanced characterization on a blue crystal and on a yellow crystal to confirm that the technique is indeed working. So we did polarized uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy, and indeed you can observe that from this blue mode at 71 reciprocal centimeter, we can clearly see that a blue crystal is rotated by 90 degrees with respect to a yellow crystal uh, because the symmetry of this mode is also uh, rotating by 90 degrees. This technique, this polarized Raman, takes a few hours for each measurement, while this optical image is, is very easy, just like a few seconds, and you have immediately an uh, idea on how your crystals are oriented. So that's very useful for developing a, a recipe uh, of an, of an epitaxial uh, two-dimensional two material. The good thing is that this method also works for uh, different materials. So every material that, that, that is a triaxial material and it has varier, varying refractive indices in the visible uh, light, it will reflect different uh, colors. So we can apply this method at different materials. For example, tin sulfide will work. Also, orthorhombic tungsten ditelenite, it will be possible to measure 90 degree twins and also in black phosphorus. Uh, this method will be very possible, so very useful uh, for the development of these kind of uh, materials. Then we uh, wondered if this method also works for a few monolayers. So if you have a few monolayers that are closed, will we be able to see rotational domains uh, or not? So we modified the growth, the growth recipe of our tin selenite on cubic magnesium oxide. And then by changing the temperature by a few uh, tens of degrees, we are able to uh, grow a tin film this time. So now we have a tin film of five nanometers. So this means around nine uh, monolayers that are closed. And then the top monolayer is, is indeed open. That's a general thing that you usually see with these materials. It's difficult to close uh, the top layer. But at least we have a few closed layers uh, buried below uh, this uh, unclosed top layer. And then again, we did this optical microscopy method. And then we observed that we have blue pixels, that we have yellow pixels, uh, confirming again that we can observe these rotational domains even in a closed uh, tin film. So it's very interesting. We can, we can measure grain size. We can measure grain boundaries in, in a closed film of a two-dimensional material, which is very interesting. We can also start quantifying how many blue pixels we see, how many yellow pixels we see. 
to get an idea on the distribution of these rotational domains. And it turns out to be 50-50, uh, which is in agreement with our uh, anticipated uh, epitaxial relationship. And it should work down to the monolayer limit. So how do we then get rid of these rotational domains? How do you go to our single domain oriented SNSC? That's when we started look, uh, looking at uh, different uh, growth substrates, different surfaces. For example, the A-plane sapphire surface is a surface that matches better the, the two-fold symmetry of SNSC because the superstructure is also a rectangle, which is the same for SNSC. On top of that, it's not only the symmetry that is matched, it's also the lattices that are matched. For example, if you would uh, have a three by two domain of SNSC on the superstructure of sapphire, we will see that we will have low lattice mismatches in both orthogonal directions. And if we would rotate the structure by 90 degrees, we would see that our lattice mismatch is increasing for both directions. So from in terms of like uh, anticipated the actual relationship, we expected that this domain would be preferred and this domain would have a lower binding energy and will not, will not be formed. And if this is indeed, is indeed the case, it's also an important message that even for two-dimensional materials, lattice matching can be an important aspect to, uh, to grow a high crystalline quality two-dimensional materials. So it's not only about symmetry, but it's also about lattices. The lattices need to be matched in order to have high quality material. So then we developed uh, the recipe for SNSC growth on A-plane sapphire. Uh, it's challenging to completely close the layer. We see that we still have some, some gaps in our tin film. So we have a tin film of around six nanometers with some, some gaps that are still present, but you see sharp read streaks. And from this optical uh, method, we only observe yellow pixels, confirming that all the zigzag directions are oriented in the same orientations, confirming that we have single uh, domain oriented SNSC grown on A-plane sapphire. So this is a very interesting way to, to produce uh, high crystalline quality SNSC. Here on the bottom part, you see again uh, this simulation, but now on the x-axis, we have a different parameter. Here we show the angle of the polarizer with respect to the analyzer. In this scenario, the angle is slightly lower than 90 degrees, so it's 86 degrees where we expect only yellow light. If you would switch this angle to slightly above 90 degrees, for example, 94 degrees, we would expect only blue pixels and indeed, all the yellow pixels, they shift into blue pixels, confirming again, single, single domain oriented SNSC on A-plane sapphire. So it's a very useful method. Uh, it goes very fast and it's, it gives lots of uh, interesting information about your actual growth. We did some more advanced characterization to again, confirm that it's single crystalline. So we did uh, in-plane XRD RSM uh, to measure the, the QX and the QY planes. And then we basically observed uh, in this orientation that we only observe the O2O peak. When we rotate it by 90 degrees in the plane, we only observe the 2OO peak, confirming again that we have a single crystalline growth of SNC on a sapphire. From the cross-sectional TM image, you can also see the layered structure and the nice uh, crystalline quality that we have. So to summarize the, the work that was done during my postdoc uh, and also during this research project at uh, 2 dcc we have uh, developed a new optical method to measure rotational domains in triaxial uh, materials. And with this method, we could confirm uh, the growth of thin selenide uh, that is done in the state-of-the-art literature. So people tend to grow this on, on cubic substrates, and then you tend to have these 90 degree twins. Uh, but then we also developed a new epitaxy process to uh, develop a recipe for a single domain oriented SNSC using uh, the growth of SNC on A-plane sapphire. And that's very interesting now for photonic applications because now we know that all our zigzag orientations and all the armchair orientations are in exactly the same orientation. And we can make use of this optical anisotopy uh, to make some, some photonic devices out of it. There is one more thing that I didn't uh, specify uh, yet. We also know from the crystal structure that every layer, every individual layer, as a, a polar moment. So it's a, it's a, there's an electrical dipole in, in every layer. So it is still possible, this optical technique is not sensitive to uh, this electrical dipole. So it is possible that these arrows are still pointing into the different, in different orientations. And we're currently uh, trying to figure out how we can measure this. So we're looking, we're thinking about second harmonic generation or uh, piezo response uh, force uh, microscopy to measure this uh, polar moment. Uh, 
And also, if it's possible, for example, to switch uh, this polarization, it could be something interesting for, for some in-plane uh, for electric applications. But we're currently working on that to, to, to figure out if what is going on here and how, how, how we can measure it. So th this brings me to the uh, second part of my presentation, which is the basically the work that I did uh, during my PhD at IMEC that is mostly focused on uh, transition metal uh, dicalc coconides. Um, so the structure of a transition metal dicalc coconide is shown here on the left-hand side of this uh, screen. So it's basically uh, a sandwich structure of ABA stacked hexagonal planes. You have a calcium plane stacked between a metal plane and then another calcium plane. The space group of these materials uh, of a single monolayer is the space group uh, 187. And the most important aspect of these, this figure that I show here is that you have some points in this uh, crystal structure that have a threefold rotational axis. So that means that every time you rotate these crystals by 120 degrees, you obtain uh, the same symmetry. And then this is also this symmetry the importance of this symmetry is shown here in this graph where uh, on the right, where uh, the, the performance of transistor is measured across uh, a certain grain boundary with a certain disorientation angle. And then you can observe here, for example, when you measure the mobility of molybdenum disulfide across a grain boundary, a 60 degree grain boundary, an inversion domain boundary, you see that the mobility is a few uh, times lower than mobility of uh, pristine material without a grain boundary. So that also means that when you break this symmetry, when you create an inversion domain boundary, you scatter the mobility and the mobility becomes, you scatter the charge carrier and the mobility becomes lower. So it's important if you wanna use these materials uh, for most optimal device performance or so for most optimal transistor performance, that we get rid of 60 U twins because 60 U twins, they will uh, reduce the mobility by a few by a factor of two or three. So it's important uh, to focus also on, on the, the reduction of these twins. And in general, if you have misorientation angles that are lower than six degrees, you see that it's even more uh, detrimental for your uh, mobility. So then in my PhD, uh, I basically studied uh, three different epitaxial processes. Uh, and we looked at the formation of these rotational domains in these three processes. We basically focused on homoepitaxial growth, so the growth of a TMD on top of its own surface. Uh, we also tried to make some heterostructures where we grow a TMD material on a different TMD surface. And then we also tried to integrate uh, a TMD compound on top of a conventional uh, three-dimensional substrate, for example, uh, sapphire. And that's then called in the literature quasi van der Waals heterotaxial growth because the interaction at the interface is it's a mixture between van der Waals and covalent interactions uh, because you have to find a way to passivate the dangling bonds that you have here, for example. So as a first part uh, about van der Waals homoeptactual nucleation of tungsten disulfide. So what we did is we bought again these large crystals from this website and we exfoliated large crystals of tungsten disulfide on top of a silicon wafer. And then we inserted that wafer into our MB growth chamber and we grew uh, tungsten disulfide on top of that single crystalline tungsten disulfide surface. And from the AFM image, you can see here that this was this is the flake that we have. So we did a large uh, area image and we can measure the whole flake that was exfoliated. And then all the small crystals that you see on top of that is what we grow using our MB uh, approach where we grow uh, some MB crystals of tungsten disulfide on top of the things I saw at the surface. Then we found a, a monolayer thick uh, flake, and then we transferred this monolayer thick flake uh, to a TM grid, and we did some advanced TM characterization. Uh, and then from selective area diffraction pattern, we observed that we have a single diffraction pattern. So that means that all our tungsten isolate crystals that are nucleated on top of this tungsten isolate surface, they are in perfect epitaxial registry. So that's good. We don't have this large in plane mosaic spread. But what we observe actually is that we have all these different colors here in this image and every color corresponds to a different uh, stacking sequence. So it turns out that we cannot control uh, the stacking sequence of, uh, of tungsten isolide homoepitaxial growth. So we try to grow it on top of its own surface, 
but it just doesn't know how to grow on itself, you form a high density of stacking folds. And that is very, very challenging, of course, because when all these crystals, when they will coalesce, coalescence, they will form a grain boundary and they will reduce the mobility in a transistor, for example. We analyzed the orientation of all these different uh, triangles. And then we basically found that there's a correlation between uh, the crystal phase and the orientation. So every crystal that is yellow here in this picture is stacked in the 2H phase. And this has an angle of 90 degrees, according to this convention. And then all the green and the, and the, and the red crystals, they are stacked in the 3R phase. And they have an angle of 30 degrees, according to this convention. So we can clearly see that we can easily measure uh, 90 degree twins from, from, from this image just by looking at the orientation of these crystals. So we can also now look at AFM data. And we can look at AFM data, how these crystals are oriented with respect to each other. And every time when they are rotated by 90 degrees, we know that they are, that they are uh, grown in a different phase. So 2H versus 3R phase. And then it means that they will also form a grain boundary when they coalesce uh, together. So that's then what we did in the next slide. So we tried to grow different uh, TMDs using also different uh, techniques just to get a more general understanding about home architectural growth of these TMDs. We wanted to make sure that this is something that doesn't occur only for tungsten isomide, but we basically observed that it also, that these 60 degree twins also observe if we grow molybdenum disulfide on top of its own surface with MBE, and it also happens if we grow molybdenum disulfide on top of its own surface with an MOVBE technique. So it's a very uh, general uh, observation here uh, that stacking folds such as 60 twins is something very universal and something very fundamental uh, that happens in van der Waals homeopathy of TMDs. So this is really uh, a very challenging aspect. These materials, they don't know how to grow on top of each other. And then we try to quantify uh, the defects that will be generated as a consequence of the formation of this uh, stacking fold. Uh, so we did here some, some TM characterization and we can basically observe that indeed crystals that are stacked in a different phase, when they coalesce together, you will form a grain boundary, which is known as a 60 degree grain boundary or an inversion domain boundary. Um, we have these nucleation experiments I can quantify the nucleation density that we have. And we also know how many crystals are oriented in, in the 2H phase and how many crystals are oriented in the 3R phase. So then we made some simulations here where all these white triangles are my initial nuclei. And these white triangles are pointing up, either up or are pointing either down. And they represent then the different, uh, the different phases where they, are, where they are grown in. So for tungsten isolated MB, the contribution was 60% in one phase, 40% in the other phase, and nucleation density was 5 e to the power 10 square, uh, square centimeter. And then we let these wide triangles grow. And every time when a, a triangle coalesces with a triangle that is stacked in a different phase, we mark it with a black line. And then this black line corresponds then to the formation of 60 degree green boundary. And then from this simulation, we can quantify the defect density. So that's basically what we did then. We quantified the defect density for our tungsten disulfide MB home architectural experiments. And we basically turn out, it turns out that we have a defect density, that we will have a defect density when the layers are closed, which is on the order of uh, one e to the power 10 per square centimeter. So it's very large. Certainly, if we compare it with homeopathical growth of silicon, for example, homeopathical growth of silicon can be, can be done with a uh, defect density as low as one e to the power three uh, per square centimeter. So there's still lots of work uh, to be done to reduce the defect density of uh, homeopathical growth of these transition metal dicarbonides. We played around with some parameters in the simulation. What happens, for example, if we improve our control on the bilayer stacking phase? What if we go to 70% or 80% or 90% of the crystals stacked in the same uh, phase? We can reduce the defect density by a factor of uh, 10, but still it remains a very large uh, defect density, even if you can control 90% of the crystals to be oriented in exactly the same orientation. So it's all, it all, it is it's very dependent on the nucleation density. So here we made different simulations with uh, different nucleation densities. Every time when we can reduce the nucleation density, we can see that we can also reduce uh, the defect density. So nucleation density really becomes very key. Uh, we really have to reduce the nucleation density so that we can grow larger grains and therefore we can make uh, 2D materials with, with lower amount of, of grain boundaries. 
So we, we quantified the lower uh, boundary of the defect density, and we basically found out that it's all about nucleation density. Every time we can reduce the nucleation density by a factor of 10, we can also reduce the defect density by a factor of 10. So that's very important to take into account. Then we started to grow uh, uh, heterostructures. Um, for example, we started growing tungsten disulfide on different kind of TMB surfaces, molybdenum disulfide, disulfide, tungsten disulfide, molybdenum disulfide. We did AFM characterization. We did the same analysis, and then we basically observed that all these cases, we observe characteristic triangles. All these triangles are in the texture registry, and we see we observe uh, 62 twins. However, this time we introduced a lattice mismatch, but we observed from TM characterization that these crystals grow fully relaxed. So they grow, uh, they uh, they are fully relaxed. So there's there they grow with they grow with their own lattice parameter. So this means that the uh, TMD van der Waals heteropetaxis they behave very similar as TMD van der Waals homoepitaxis. We quantified, we see some differences. We observed some differences in all these different experiments. So then we quantified the nucleation density of all these experiments that I did. So uh, I grow four different TMD epi layers on four different in the substrate, and I quantified nucleation density. And then we basically observed uh, a trend. Every time when we grow on tungsten disulfide, we see, for example, that the nucleation density was lower than when we grow on molybdenum disul disulfide, for example. So we always observe that this color becomes more darker when we go to the right. We did some DFT simulation, and we basically found that the surface energy of molybdenum disulfide is larger compared to the surface energy of tungsten disulfide. And that's basically how we linked surface energy uh, with nucleation density. So whenever we grow, you grow a two-dimensional material on top of a surface that has a higher surface energy, you also end up with a higher uh, nucleation density. So that's how we were able to link surface energy uh, with uh, defect density in TMD van der Waals uh, heterostructures. We also did experiments where we grow on seaplane uh, oriented sapphire surfaces. Uh, again, sapphire is interesting because it has a good uh, lattice match with things nice sunlight, for example. If you consider a three, two by three structure on a two by two structure, the lattice mismatch is only minus uh, 4.0%. Um, it also has interesting properties. It's a single crystalline surface. It's robust. It's atomically flat. It has steps and terraces. We observed actually that these steps and terraces that these terraces are not exactly the same. You have different uh, surface termination on these different terraces. That's observed from this depth histogram. You see that you, you have different step heights. And these different step heights, they correspond to uh, different uh, surface terminations. And that's also why you have different lengths in the terrace, terraces. So it's important to take that into account that you have different uh, terminations of your surface. We try to grow epitaxial things I saw on this uh, sapphire surface. But basically, if we didn't do any pretreatment, it didn't work. We, the orientation of our things I saw was just random in plane. We had the same diffraction pattern in all different orientations. But then we basically observed that if we can make a reconstruction, if we can do some thermal annealing of the sapphire substrate, then we can obtain epitaxial growth of things nice on on uh, sapphire. That's clearly observed from this uh, orientational dependent uh, diffraction pattern. We basically observe a different dif uh, dif architectural uh, relation on these two different reconstructed surfaces. And that was explained by the fact that here, this is a very complex surface reconstruction. Um, this, the top surface is actually a hexagonal layer that is rotated by 30 degrees with respect uh, to the build crystals. And basically, the tungsten disulfide unit cells, they just follow the orientation of uh, your top surface of your sapphire. So we observed that the reconstruction surface, they control the epitaxial relation. And it also controls uh, strain, for example, because in this case, we observed some strain. Uh, this minus 4% of strain, we observed that uh, in our read uh, diffraction data. But still, we, were, we observed that we have a very high density of uh, 60 twins from this TM characterization. So even though the interactions are a little bit stronger, because we can observe some strain, so that is in agreement with some stronger interactions, we still observe a very high density of uh, 60 degree twins. So we cannot come up to control the, the formation of these 60 degree twins. We tried to make some, some devices out of it, but basically the, the current and the performance was very low. And we, we, we linked this low performance due to this very high nucleation density that we have and the very high density of grain boundaries, uh, of 60 degree grain boundaries in these uh, recipes. So how do we integrate 
high quality TMDs on, on a silicon uh, wafer, for example, if you want to go for architectural growth and transfer, it is very important uh, to focus on nucleation density. The lower the nucleation density will be, the lower the defect density uh, will be. So uh, I did a review on all the nucleation densities that I could find from publications out there in the literature. And I basically observed a correlation between nucleation density and growth. And that's not so surprising. Every growth technique that can grow these materials at a higher temperature, they significantly have a lower nucleation density and therefore also a lower defect density. With MBE, you're unfortunately a little bit limited in the growth temperature because of the sticking of the, of the calcium. Um, the advantage of using epitaxy and transfer is that you have a good crystalline quality. The disadvantage is, of course, that you need to transfer and that you have, that you're limited by the wafer size. There is some interesting work going on in reducing the amount of 60 twins, uh, for example, by growing tensile cells on HBN. I think this is work from, from Penn State. Uh, you can reduce the amount of twins uh, uh, by a significant amount when you create a certain uh, defect. So that's an interesting approach, approach to get rid of 60 twins. Also, for example, by growing on sapphire, and when you and you know, you, when you try to uh, prefer uh, stimulate nucleation at step edges, for example, you can also make sure that all your crystals align in one particular orientation. So that's also a promising approach. The, the downside, of course, is, is it will be difficult to have large, to have 200 millimeter sapphire or 300 millimeter sapphire, and then do a 300 millimeter transfer to uh, silicon. Uh, but at least these are interesting uh, works in order to reduce this, the amount of 60 twins. You can also try to deposit uh, directly on a dielectric surface, for example. But then again, nucleation density becomes very important because you will have, uh, you will have uh, rotational domains with uh, smaller misorientation angles and they will reduce your mobility also by a significant amount. Maybe another approach is the approach of like one grain for each transistor, where you try to selectively grow uh, two-dimensional materials on top of uh, selectively grow to the mesh material so that you don't have uh, grain boundaries or you basically try to avoid uh, coalescence. And this brings me to the final part, which is just uh, two, two more slides uh, about some work that I did on trichococonides, so basically bismuth sunlight growth. We basically observe for bismuth sunlight growth, if we do home actual growth on bismuth sunlight, we don't have these rotational domains. Uh, so that's very interesting. For tungstenite sunlight, we see a double peak. Uh, for bismuth cell, we only see one peak. So in bismuth cell, we don't have these rotational domains. And despite the fact that it's also two-dimensional material, it is governed by weak interlayer interactions, bismuth cell is not prone to this twin formation. So we try to explain why we don't have these stacking faults in bismuth cell. And we think binding energy is, is the key here. We simulated different binding energies for all different uh, stacking combinations that give a local minima. And then basically you see very similarities uh, for tungsten isolite compared to bismuth cellulite. So tungsten isolite is an orange. The preferred stacking here is, is this one. And then tungsten isolite has two preferred uh, twins that are uh, shown here. Bismuth cellulite preferred stacking is A, B prime. And then again, it has two most stable uh, 60 degree twins. We observe that there is a slight, slightly larger energy difference between the 60 degree twins for bismuth cellulite. So the energy difference for uh, bismuth cell is 11 milli electron volts per unit cells. For tungsten dicellite, it's only five milli electron volts per unit cell. So maybe that is an explanation why we don't see the formation of these stacking faults in, in bismuth cell. However, it's a very minor difference. So I'm not sure if this explains the whole, uh, the whole picture. So we also did some, some experiments where we looked at rotations of these nuclei. So when these nuclei rotate, we basically observed that the binding energy of bismuth cellulite is uh, way larger compared to the binding energy of tungsten cellulite. So that also means whenever you go outside of the potential registry for bismuth cellulite, your energy increases significantly. So it's way more difficult for bismuth cellulite to rotate and to hover around over the surface and to, to rotate to a different stacking sequence. So we basically think that is also part of the reason why we don't have these stacking faults in bismuth cellulite, because we have a significantly higher binding energy in bismuth cellulite and that hinders uh, the rotation of the, the nuclease. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation. So I think I hope I've convinced you that there is significant research interest in, in two-dimensional calcogonides, but that there is a need for a high quality tin film uh, synthesis uh, technique. 
in order for these materials to become a mature technology. And then I also presented on rotational domains and degraded crystalline quality that these things are abundantly observed in the textual growth of uh, two-dimensional calcogonites. And there's still lots of room for, for a better uh, fundamental understanding. These are some references that I used in the slides. And then thank you uh, for your attention. Also, thank you to all the contributors uh, that made this work possible. Uh, my supervisors, people that assisted me in the growth, characterization, modeling, and processing. Uh, and thank you uh, so much for your attention. Okay, so we'll keep the recording rolling for a few questions. Um, anybody online would like to ask a question first? Looks like Fernaz raised his hand. Please go ahead, Fernaz, unmute yourself. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. That was really interesting. That was just, I don't have a question. That was like the clap for the Okay, just making sure. Presentation. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, we do have a raised hand now. Ralph Page, go ahead and unmute yourself. I just wonder, I'm just wondering, uh, could he back up one slide so I can take a picture of the reference list? <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> that went by really fast. Okay, great. Thanks. So just so you know, everyone, these webinars are on YouTube, Infinitum. We have over 15,000 views so far, these science presentations, so apparently they're popular. All right. Anyone else questions online before we move to on-site folks? There we got one from Sai. Go ahead, Sai. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> great presentation, Walter. Thank you. Uh, I just had one quick question about the stackings, the 2H versus 3R. Uh, like, are there, is there a difference in layer number as well? Or if you can just explain a little bit about A prime versus uh, a, where you said, where you described 2H as A prime and then 3R as AB. So, yeah, here, this is where. Uh, is there a layer number difference or uh, is everything two layer thick? Or, yeah. Yeah, so, so everything is two layers uh, thick here. So we have a surface, which is tungsten selenite coming from the flake. That's a monolayer thick surface. Okay. And then we nucleated as an extra single layer on top of that. And then the convention is that when it's stacked in, in like this fashion, so that you can see it here as well. So in the AA prime fashion, then the calcans align over the metal atoms and the metal atoms align over the calcan atoms. And that's only enabled when you have a rotation of 60 degrees with respect to the different layers um, so that's called the 2h phase and then the the phase where it's not rotated is called the 3r phase even though you just have two layers correct yeah it makes sense thank you thank you. i just wanted to just double check if there is a layer number difference uh, sometimes it's confusing but uh, yeah thank you thanks a lot yeah okay on site here anyone any questions slava okay. um Actually, I have two questions. One is related to that slide. Um, the islands are all distributed to three groups, uh, uh, red, green, and yellow. Uh, do you see any islands that do not fill in the particular category? Other rotationally uh, disordered uh, islands, uh, especially of the small size? Yeah. Uh, we did not resolve that, so I think they're they're not present. Uh, it's also because it's tungsten isolite grown on its own surface, so there is no lattice mismatch. So the local minima are are very well defined, and that's also observed from like the selective error diffraction pattern. We only see a single hexagonal pattern confirming that everything that is grown is at least following the same uh, epitaxial relationship as the surface below. But we just have some lateral shifts and some rotations of 60 degrees, which we which tends to be way more difficult uh, to be controlled. Yeah, that's what I've heard, but thank you for confirming. Uh, and the second question is that for the last uh, part of your third part of your presentation, uh, I didn't catch, uh, is there any reference to that one or that was unpublished work? Oh, this is also uh, work that is published uh, here in, in this publication. So it's in oh, advanced procedures. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There okay, we you. presented this work. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thanks. Anyone else in the room? Right, crowd. Okay. I guess I can ask one question. Yeah, go ahead, Yushan. Um, so you talk about uh, 
growing materials at high temperature can reduce nucleation density. Well, uh, is there any other way uh, you would suggest to reduce nucleation density for uh, MBE? Like, have you tried to design multiple state growth, uh, customize the nucleation step and separate from growth step? Then maybe you can uh, try to engineer nucleation density in MBE. Yeah, that's of course a good question. And if you have uh, a good answer on this, then it will really help uh, architectural growth of, of these materials with MBE. Uh, a few things that I can add. So here you can see from this green cloud that a higher temperature helps. There is one data point here where people have grown with MBE at 900 degrees C, and then you see that you have a very low nucleation density, so high temperature helps. There is also an interesting difference if you compare Van der Waals epitaxy with quasi Van der Waals epitaxy. So if you use MBE and you grow on a two-dimensional surface, for example, graphene or other TMDs or HBN, your nucleation density also tends to be lower compared to when you grow on sapphire or aluminum nitride or other three or other three-dimensional substrates. So that's already a, a difference that we see. Growing on a Van der Waals surface already reduces nucleation density. But then how do you get even lower nucleation density on a Van der Waals surface? That's something very challenging. Uh, I don't really have uh, clear answers. If you have defect assisted nucleation, then you should try to avoid defects on your, on your surface. But uh, that's a challenging, that's a challenging aspect uh, to, to, to do. Uh, it's a good question, but it's a very difficult answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs>